All right, well, I think now is as good a time as any to get started, and I don't think I need this because I'm not recording it, so uh, I'm not recording the sound. Um, so welcome, everybody. Um, this is uh, a site-building case study for, um, for this website, ApertureExpert.com. Um, it's a Drupal 7 site, and we're just going to take a look at some of the stuff involved in how I built this thing. And... Um, this is going to be pretty informal as these things go. Um, got a few slides, and then we're gonna we're gonna just get into kind of looking at whatever y'all feel like looking at. Uh, my name is Joe Chelman. I'm a freelance web developer and uh, web designer. And uh, this is ApertureExpert.com. Screenshot thereof. Um, Aperture is a uh, soon well. You know, within a year or so, it'll uh, it'll go the way of the dodo. Um, so this is a site that is going to be pivoting rather rapidly, but um, but it is a place to learn about photography and uh, and the the history of it is specifically toward um, Aperture, which is Apple's uh, pro photo editing software that basically created the category that Lightroom has now taken uh, taken over. Um, as I say, it's going to be pivoting soon. So, uh, but the site will 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 go on um, in a new form that uh, I am not allowed to disclose yet. But uh, but it, we can still talk about a lot of the features, which are going to be uh, very similar even after the pivot. So, uh, I have here what I'm calling the mega slide of doom. Uh, you could also think of this as the site building buffet uh, or you know whatever. But there's a there's a lot of features that are uh, on this website that. I thought people might potentially be interested in hearing more about. We are definitely not going to go over all of them. But uh, anything, uh, I'll just give you a quick overview of what these things are, and then we can talk about, um, or you can sort of decide what things you might actually want to see or have me discuss more or whatever. So um, I just barfed them out all, all on the one slide since we'll, uh, we'll, we can look at any of them um, individually later. So I'm going to run these down. Um, this site offers video training, and the uh, the guy who owns the site does training with Lynda.com. Uh, he and I met through uh, another smaller publisher that we both worked for. We both actually now work for Lynda.com as well. But um, but in addition to the things that he does for other publishers, he has his own self-published video training, and so we worked to uh, integrate Amazon CloudFront to uh, host those files in an authenticated way so that instead, like if you just put the stuff on S3, Amazon S3, uh, to keep the bandwidth off your own site, um, then you it's not as easy to uh, make sure that people can't just download the thing if they figure out what the URL is. So using Amazon CloudFront, you can do that in an authenticated way, and so we did a little bit of integration with Ubercart to make that happen. Um, yes? Is this P7? This is all Drupal 7. Okay. Yep. Um, there's a, uh, for the Ubercart comes with a, uh, and incidentally we did use Ubercart, not Drupal Commerce for this, um, because the mapping of, uh, just a node to being a, a purchasable thing just seemed to make sense. And, uh, you know, Ubercart works just as well in Drupal 7 as Commerce does. But, uh, it does come with, with PayPal integration, but the PayPal module, uh, supports a single PayPal account. And this, this guy wanted to be able to support PayPal micropayments. So PayPal has a different fee structure. If you uh, if you are using your PayPal account primarily to sell things that don't cost very much, um, but the as I say, the Ubercart's PayPal module only supported one account, so there was only one fee structure available. And he sells things that go across uh, the price range. So I forked the uh, PayPal module and wrote a new version that can support two accounts and ship it off. Um, depending on which one, uh, depending on how much the thing is. There's some CK Editor uh, customization. So CK Editor is the rich text editor that, uh, or one of the rich text editors that you can use either through the CK Editor module or through WYSIWYG API module. And uh, he wanted things like being able to add some fields to the image pop-up and just other, other little bits of customization. So uh, I can show you some of that. 
His old site was run on Squarespace, and I did this major migration project um, using mm -hmm. Migrate module to get that stuff in. I've talked about that uh, before. Um, I don't think at a previous camp, but uh, at meetups. Uh, but we could we can also look at that. Uh, I implemented autosave for uh, nodes using this uh, JavaScript library called Garlic, which we can look at. Um, there is social login, so people can create accounts using their Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook accounts, and that is run through hybrid auth module, uh, which is one that I had not really heard of until I started working on this website. It's quite good. You can check, take a look at that. Um, social sharing. So he wanted posts to be able to be blasted out to his various you know, social networks. And instead of using something, using a contributed module built directly into Drupal 7, we use the service Twitter feed, which is based on RSS. Um, contribute, uh, contributions, donations, tips, whatever. Um, there's a, a way for people to add a tip to their cart when they go to buy something. Um, they can also just, uh, just buy a tip, and I can show you how that works. There is a relatively recently uh, added feature where people can submit content. Um, a, a major feature of this site is the news and the tips that he publishes telling people how to do different stuff with Aperture. Uh, but keeping that stuff up and publishing as often he, as he would like to do while having to write everything himself as an actual working professional photographer was not super practical. So he opened up the floor to his... Um, many thousands of registered users to say, if anybody would like to write some articles, you know, submit them. So we built a very simple workflow um, to uh, let people contribute stuff while um, not letting them just directly publish necessarily. Uh, reviews on ordered products, this refers to uh, basically just enabling comments on products, but then doing a little bit of customization so they actually look um, more like, uh, or treated more like reviews than as comments. It's not super crazy, but, um, but that's, that's what that is. Uh, user profile customization, that's uh, just using content, pro uh, not content profile module, this is Drupal 7, uh, we're, but using uh, the displayed profiles for, for these users and uh, doing some basic customization so there weren't you know, bajillion tabs showing all the different features that users might not actually care about and renaming some stuff and just basically a lot of uh, form alters and some other things, but there's that. Uh, in Ubercart, uh, most of the time, these are all, everything that's sold on the site is virtual products. They're all video training and other downloads. So having a quantity uh, field on your shopping cart doesn't really make a lot of sense. So there's a little bit of uh, custom code in there to stop that from, uh, from being a thing. Custom user stats refers to, um, it's not really being used very much except just to track how many things people have posted in the very active forums. Uh, whether somebody has submitted articles, how many comments they've made. There are ideas that eventually this might be converted into some sort of user points thing to like just gamify the site somehow or g grant people higher status and more permissions to do stuff if they are very active users. Um, so far, it is just collecting the data and displaying it in certain places, and that is what the uh, C-Tools slash Panels plugins is about. Um, Panels, for if you are not familiar with it, is a, is a way of uh, creating custom layouts on your site using, uh, if you want, it, you can either use the UI that's built into the module or you can write a little bit of custom code to do some stuff. Um, and writing plugins for it is something that I feel like not a lot of people do, but uh, if you want to display custom data in your panels, you need to write just a little bit of custom code and, uh, so I can show that. Um, a custom cancel button, this is about the simplest thing imaginable, but um, when you're posting a piece of content, you could say, ah, you know what, I don't want to do this anymore, and, and cancel. Such a thing doesn't exist, you could just use the back button, but um, we, he specifically wanted to have a button there that does something, so there's a button with a little modicum of custom behavior. Um, the theme for the site is built on Zurb Foundation, so we, could, we can check that out. It's just a front-end framework uh, that is responsive and, and stiff. Uh, with retina images, this uh, refers to the site deals mostly with Aperture, um, but we're talking about a, a Mac product, so there's this whole issue of like Retina images. If you're working on a on a Mac that has a Retina display and you take a screenshot of it, you've got a Retina um, you've got a Retina screenshot, a high DPI screenshot, which if you just display it on a conventional display like say this machine that I'm using, it's like huge. So being able to manage those and and not have it be a 
major pain in the butt to add those things to posts and um, and make them look good, you know, both on uh, on conventional devices and high DPI devices without having to create a bunch of derivative images and all that kind of nonsense um, is uh, just we did a little bit of work there. Um, we can also talk about the details of how the site is hosted. The short answer is it's hosted on Linode with uh, a few things there. Um, and we can also talk about the insanity of the day that the site actually launched um, and was converted over from Squarespace. Uh, short answer is it turns out the site is way more popular than either of us knew in terms of uh, the impact that the traffic would have, on, especially on that first day and, and just kind of over time and how we dealt with that. So... Uh, that there's there's the big menu. We'll come back to this in a second. Um, I do want to mention a few things that are uh, specific contributed modules that we used on this site that um, are ones that I feel like people don't talk about necessarily quite as much that I just wanted to highlight as actually useful. Um, advanced forum module is a is a way to uh, just enhance the forums on the site through uh, a combination of views and some and some custom templates and stuff, um, which basically makes the forums not suck. Um, so it's it's pretty nice. Um, Apache Solar Search. If uh, if you are not familiar with um, with Apache Solar, it's a it's a very popular um, engine that uh, it's it's a search engine that is based on the Lucene project from from the Apache Foundation. That is Apache, the maker of the very popular web server. Uh, that's putting it. I, I'm underselling that uh, slightly, I guess. But uh, anyway, Apache Solar is is much much, much, much better than uh, than any built-in search that comes with any open source project whatsoever. So that it's, you know, and the Drupal, the built-in Drupal search is fine. It's it's barely adequate. We'll put it that way. Um, and so with Apache Solar, you get the ability to not only do, you know, searches that, that return more relevant posts, but you can do things like, um, like, Get the get things that are related to a post totally for free. It just does all that kind of analysis and can just say, "Here's this thing, and now here's a bunch of stuff that's related to it." You don't have to do any weird stuff with taxonomy, or you don't have to do any real figuring out of what you think um, of how you want to do this related stuff. You can just basically ask, and it'll and it'll tell you. Um, and you can also do faceted search. So here's a list of search results, and give me everything in this result set that was posted in April of this year or that was posted by this person, or both of those things at once, or whatever. So it's, it's really great, and uh, specifically for this site, we used uh, an external provider of search. You can get um, Apache Solar integration if you are an Acquia customer. Um, it's a little pricey um, in my experience, but there is a service which is called Hosted Apache Solar, um, which is a site which... Uh, is actually now run by a guy who is starting to work for Acquia in October, but it's something that he runs on his own. Um, and uh, it's like $10 a month, and it's uh, really nice. It integrates very well with, uh, with Drupal. He is a Drupal guy, and um, and we we use it on the site, and it's, it's really excellent. And it, it makes dealing with Apache Solar so much easier than if you were to try to set it up yourself, um, even if we're a relatively savvy person, yes. Have you used um, the um, uh, what is it? Custom custom Google search. Custom Google search. I have used custom Google search. How yes. How does that compare to the custom Google search? Well, uh, in terms of the results that you get, I mean, so it's a little different in the sense that you're relying on Google's index of your site when you use the custom Google search, mm -hmm. and you're also. Uh, depending on how much you pay them or whatever. I, I haven't used it in a little while. I don't know how much customization you could do to the results um, or if it's presented in sort of a custom Google UI still um, or if you still, what I, I guess what I mean is do you still, still see the Google logo and all that. Um, Apache Solar is your own thing. The results are presented on your own site. Um, Apache Solar runs as its own separate um, service but it delivers the results to the Drupal uh, to a Drupal module that, that pr then presents them in a themable way, just like anything else. So, um, so I, I think it. Um, yeah, I mean, don't get me wrong. Google's very good at search, but um, for custom site search, uh, I find Apache Solar to be a lot better. Okay. Um, APC status at. Oh, oh. The um, yeah. hosted Apache Solar is that the name of it? If we're going to go looking for this. Yeah, I, th I think that I think it's just hosted Apache Solar, which is spelled S O L R dot com. Yeah. Um, or you can Google it and see if I'm wrong about that. It's but it is Apache. something, something just like that. Okay. Um, APC status. Uh, APC is the um, 
is a caching, it's an opcode cache for PHP. And uh, when you have a very popular site, this is one of the things that was part of the launch insanity. We didn't have that enabled, uh, and uh, that was a huge mistake. So um, if your site is at all popular, you definitely want to make sure you're using APC um, if you're in control of your, of your own Drupal hosting. Uh, APC status is a, it's a status page that's built, uh, that sort of comes with the module. If you've ever seen a Drupal site that has an apc.php file somewhere in it, uh, that is the, the status page that comes with it that shows you how much stuff is cached and lets you clear that cache and do all that kind of thing. Having that file exposed to the public is a pretty big security risk because it's, you know, it's very powerful. So APC status can be used to, uh, to present those same results without exposing that particular PHP file. Um, and on this site especially, we, just because of the way it's set up, we couldn't even expose the, that, uh, that file even if I wanted to. So I needed to use this module to get, get those results. Are you coding everything that's custom code in PHP? Because you mentioned custom code a lot. There, there is a lot of custom code on this site. Are you using PHP to do it? Yes. Okay. Yep. Um, Cache Actions module is a, uh, is a contributed module that will let you uh, basically clear caches when certain things happen. So that, in, specifically, this is a, a way to integrate ca uh, cache actions with the rules module. So for this site, I wanted to be able to clear, like we're caching all the views to make sure that things stay fast. But views don't necessarily clear when you publish a node that appears in that view. So um, using cache actions lets you just say, all right, I just published a node, clear the main, uh, clear, clear this particular block cache um, for the home page and clear this main news page uh, views cache. So you can make sure that things are always fresh. Um, date pop-up authored. This just replaces the authored field on your uh, node add and edit pages with a date pop-up. Super simple. Yeah. APC, or is that your exclusive caching solution? Or are you also using Memcache? Oh no, that, yeah, it's not. It's not the exclusive cache. So you're using a yes, okay. yep, you're using a quite a quite a little cocktail of caches on this site. Um, but yeah, APC is a very important one to include. Um, Elijacron lets you bust up the um, among other things that it does. But one of the important things that it does is let you break up the monolithic uh, cron that Drupal normally runs and runs specific cron tasks separately. Um, really useful. IMCE file field. We did not use media module on the site to manage uh, media. It's I, I find it just to be a little heavy. Um, and this guy wanted to be able to not just upload images through Drupal, but to uh, use his existing workflows that he was kind of used to from Squarespace to be able to FTP files or you know SFTP files or whatever. Just get them onto the website outside of uh, Drupal. And if you just use something like um, file field sources to uh, inspect the in, to inspect available files and get them into image fields and things like that uh, it it won't see everything um, it needs to have a, a reference in the files table for that to work so IMCE file field will integrate with with the nice uh, lightweight media manager IMCE but then also allow you to see everything that's uploaded in the directories that it can see so it's uh, it's you know, pretty basic, but it's it's totally useful. HMS field does not stand for Her Majesty's ship. It stands for hours, minutes, and seconds. So if you have, uh, in this case, we there's a store on the site, and he wanted to be able to show the duration of different video training. And so this just gives you a field that is a time, which indicates the duration of something. Uh, Mandrill is uh, a service provided by MailChimp, the mailing list provider. Um, but it is a what's called a transactional email service. Basically, it's hosted SMTP. So what that means is you can, uh, and it's free up to, I think, something like 12,000 sent emails per month, but it gives you analytics on your sent email. So this is important for, for a site with a very active community because you, when you send out emails to people telling them that you know, they just had an account created or whatever, um, or you know, basically notifications are going out, you can track the deliverability of those messages and see you know, what has bounced without having to get everything into your inbox. Uh, and so it's much faster than using, uh, and also lighter weight, than hosting your own SMTP. You can just let somebody else do it, and you get nice analytics and all that kind of stuff. So um, check that out for sure. Um, meta tag module, uh, nothing super crazy here, just 
allows you to, to get all the as meta tags for SEO kind of stuff, but also for different social networks. The thing that I was particularly interested in was that at the time when we were building the site, meta tag had recently started to support Twitter cards. And this guy is a big, um, is big into his social media and making sure that things look nice on the different networks. So you can make, um, you can add in the custom uh, meta tags that Twitter wants for displaying posts with a link to them as Twitter cards. Does so, that agree with views as well, meta tag? Uh, yes, it does. Yep. Yes. Just because I have a little experience with that, I just want to share this because yeah, yeah. it's one of those things that's really good to know. I could not get the proper image on my page just because I have all kinds of featured content. So when I wanted, I was using Share This module, and I could not get the right image to, to actually show up when people wanted to share things. It was be the wrong image until I installed MetaTag, and it yep. fixed everything. So just in case anybody ever runs into that problem, MetaTag was like. Yeah, I mean, it, it does the Twitter card thing, and it also does like another one that a lot of people run into is the, is which image Facebook picks up when it right. when it uh, grabs your link. Exactly the problem, yeah. And so you can you can map you can tell it. Yeah. Uh, you can either tell it specifically on an individual node, or you can just and you can also set up sensible defaults across content types or whatever you like, or or across your entire site, and just say always use this particular field and use a token. Um, which would then be substituted with the with the real thing, um, and I've I've seen that just recently now you can actually separate separate or you can do separate images. I don't know why people want to do this, but you can do separate images for the HTTP version of your site and the HTTPS version of your site. So if you have separate separate image hosting, like I don't know, maybe this is good for a CDN where you have a separate um, content distribution network for your secure stuff. I don't I don't know why you do that, but it's possible. So there there you go. And then uh, also sort comments module. So this is the one that uh, lets you change the order that comments are displayed. Um, you could, of course, do this with views or whatever, but, um, but if you just want a simple little module that you can drop in and show only the newest comments first instead of the oldest comments, there, there does exist a module to do that. Um, so what's next? Um, I'm going to skip back to the uh, Mega Slide of Doom here, and uh, if there is anything in particular that you would like to see from this, uh, you can call it out, um, or I don't, I don't know if uh, anybody has written down things that they're interested in. We can also just look at the site, and I can just kind of walk you through what it looks like, and if something piques your interest, um, we, can, we can do it that way. Um, basically, I'm, I'm, I'm done with everything that I've prepared other than trying to remember everything that, that is actually on the site so I can find it if we want to talk about it. So, um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's go. Start, start here. Um, I'm interested in the retina images. Did you use a um, module for that, or did you recommend nope. custom code for that? It's, it's not a lot of custom code, actually, for the retina images thing. The, the main uh, piece is, and I don't know if I actually have, oh, wow, Pathfinder really wants to tell me this. Um, so here is the site. Um, this is my local copy of it, and I don't know that if I go here, I will see. I'm going to I'm going to see a lot of the uh, a lot of the garbage content that I uh, created while while doing the custom workflows. Um, we might not have a specific example of a Retina screenshot here, but the basically the uh, the idea. Is that um, there? There are two parts. I, I didn't want him to have to create alternate versions and do uh, do responsive images with like source sets or anything like that. Also, this this needed to be done like you know the picture module for uh, or picture module for Drupal eight, but also the, or for Drupal seven, but also the uh, the HTML five picture initiative. Um, the picture tag, I think it's called. Um, it's coming along, but the browser support. You know, it's they're, they're still it's it's getting very close, but they're still it's still not ready. So, um, so I used the techniques that I learned in this uh, in this ebook called Retinify Your Websites and Apps. Um, and so, what we tried to do is use uh, for screenshots. It's different, but for for other things where you just want the image to look nice, you use a a big juicy version of the image, but then you save it with a very low JPEG quality. So like dial it way down, down to like, you know, 20% or something, and then squeeze it into the space that you want it to fit. Um, and so there's a, there's a, a little bit of cleverness on the site, as I recall, for, for, the, for that kind of stuff, to just say, this is a, this is a big image. So I think, uh, I think what, what it is, is 
I add, in the CK editor uh, customization, there's a little place where you can set classes on things. And I, actually, that, that wasn't a customization. Um, that's just in there. So there's a retina class that you can add um, on the site, and that tells the, uh, the CSS on the site to just squeeze it into a certain, uh, a certain space for the, uh, for the size of um, you know, at the different breakpoints. So um, it's just basically if that class is there, the site knows, oh, okay, I need to squeeze this down. Um, and for screenshots, that's really important because um, otherwise you end up with iPhone screenshots that are like ginormous and, and things like that. So um, it's just a recognition that, um, that that needs to happen. Yeah. I'd love at some point. I'd love to see you go through the your use of the theme, the Zerp theme. Okay. Whether now or later. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. I guess might as well just get get a few uh, suggestions here and then take them take them as they come. I'm yeah. In, in uh, the CK editor customization, if there's time. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Content editorial workflow. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. I second that. Okay. All right. Well, the, there was a second for that one, so we'll do it first. Um, Oh, second. Uh, you, yeah, yeah. This, I'm, I'm telling you, this, we, we can do whatever we want, whatever we want. Um, all right, let's get the get that thing back in there. Okay, so uh, let's look at the content editing workflow. So I'll show you what it looks like from the perspective of somebody uh, from the. Uh, let's see, do I have Masquerade running on this guy? Um, oops. Can I log in as somebody else? I can. Okay. So let's go back here. This is the tips page, and so I'm gonna. Uh, I'm now logged in as just somebody who's a mortal um, user on the site, and so I can create a tip. And actually, so this. Uh, it, you see how these how these fields just filled in with just some some stuff when I created a new a new post. This is the autosave module in action. Um, uh, so I'll just tell you this because uh, it's something that I think is kind of neat. Uh, Garlic JS will do automatic form field saving, um, and uh, and it saves it in HTML5 local storage. So uh, so it persists, you know, as long as that as that will persist, which uh, apparently is a very long time because I did this uh, a, a few months ago. So um, and then when you revisit that same URL, it'll it'll uh, look in that HTML5 local storage and repopulate all the fields. Um, so it's a, it's a very lightweight way to do this. It's a, like the WordPress way of doing auto-saving is to create basically a revision every two seconds or something. Um, and uh, that is, to me, grossly inefficient. And you, cr you end up just creating a lot of revisions that are never used and that clog up your, your history. So I like this way of doing it because it seriously just saves the thing that you are working on. But anyway, so uh, we can actually just use this, uh, my new post, and I can talk about all this kind of stuff, blah, 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 who cares. Um, so the first thing that's, that's worth noting with, uh, with this editorial workflow that we're using is I didn't want to have to deal with a lot of custom permissions for this. So uh, what I'm doing is just using the built-in Drupal um, who authored this post uh, uh, I'm using who authored the post as my as my kind of way of managing permissions the way Drupal would normally do it. So when I create this uh, this thing as as my my other mortal user, um, it is it says that it's authored by by me right now, but that's not how it's going to be saved. When the post is saved, it automatically gets assigned to an administrative user, which I've defined elsewhere. Actually, I'm kind of curious about all of these. Uh, I think this admin menu might be cached because uh, because this is. I'm pretty sure I won't actually have access to any of this stuff. But let's let's take a quick peek and see. So, yeah. You're changing the author when you save the note. Yep. Um, uh, that, that'll make that might make more sense in a second. As soon as I. Uh, where is where am I? Where, I don't know where the settings are. I, I'm, I'm not going to have permission to see them anyway. But basically, there's there's just a custom settings page that I wrote that lets you say, all right, who is the the person that these nodes should get assigned to when they're saved? And uh, but I still want to track who originally posted the thing. So there is a field on that content type that will store the what is called here the original author. 
Um, and when, when the posts are displayed on the site, I'm not showing the Drupal author field, I'm showing the original author. Um, so there, when I had to uh, do the migrate from Squarespace, almost everything was posted actually by the, by the, the main, uh, the owner of the site. So I just did a, a quick mapping that, that just uh, populates that field for all old posts to be him. But this field always stays the same um, unless, you know, some administrator decides they're going to change it. But this is where that, that is tracked. So the thing gets saved. And as you can see, it starts out unpublished. This appears to be something that, uh, that is mapped onto me. Or actually, I shouldn't I, I think when, let's, let's just check this. When, um, I might not change it when it's first saved. Yeah, okay, so it's, it, still stays, it still stays as me for now. Um, and then, where is the, where did I put those fields? Your login is immortal, and immortal can see all these um, URL path settings and stuff like that? They can't. Uh, I think that, that that's just a consequence of the way I did the user switch. I think the admin menu is actually being cached right now. Okay. Either that or I, I accidentally gave this, this person way more permissions than they, uh, than they actually, uh, you know, this is my, my test bed, so I'm, I'm not sure which, uh, which user I am right now. Maybe I didn't switch to the right one. That's, that's another possibility. Let's see. Did I, yeah, let me leave this page and let me make sure that I'm, that I'm who I think I am. Who am I? Okay, yeah, so that, that username does have this. I must have upgraded my own uh, the permissions on this user. Let me see if I can find another one. Just some guy, you know. Where's your masquerade block? I'm not. Uh, do I actually have masquerade installed right now? Uh, admin menu can do some uh, some user switching without masquerade. Um, I know I've used it on the site, so let me just see. Let's see if we have it right now. Okay, yeah, it's it's here, but it's just not installed. Or, uh, yeah, not active. Oh, there, there's the setting. Oh, that's why. I, I set the uh, content admin to somebody else. All right, let me, let me switch to a different browser and just do it that way. And I think I might have... Some of these other logins stored in one password, so I don't have to remember what they are. Does that work? Yay, okay. There we go. Okay, so this is what it really looks like when you're when you're not somebody who is uh, an administrative user. So um, they they don't see all that other all that other good stuff. Um, and they have this submit for review. So they, uh, as I recall, um, the, uh, the people can edit this post to their heart's content. The author will still stay assigned to them as long as they are continuing to edit this thing. And then when it's ready, they can say submit for review and submit a message to the editor um, if they want to. If there's anything in particular that they thought needed a, a little bit of extra attention. So then they save it. And they can see that it's unpublished, but they can't edit it anymore. And the reason they can't edit it is because the author has been changed to the, that administrative user. So then over here, um, when I'm logged in as that administrator user, go to the content overview. There might be a dashboard for this. I actually can't remember if I if I made a, a little dashboard, but this is the uh, this is the one. And so the author is set to uh, me, the uh, the administrative person. I can see that it's not published, and I can go in here and take a look at it. And so I can see all that stuff, and I've got the uh, the original author noted here. So I can either just say, all right, this is ready to go, let's publish it. Um, or if not, I can say, send this back for editing. And then give them a little message, this is just included in an email. And uh, 
and that, so I send it back to them. Now, if I look at this content overview again, now, of course, you know, this is just a guy. You can just see that it's, it's a slightly different person, but it is set back to them, so now they have permission to edit the thing again. Um, this, is, uh, this could be done, uh, I talked about rules earlier, uh, this, could, this part could be done, a lot of it could be done with rules. You would have to um, get in there and add the checkbox or whatever other UI stuff you want to do. Um, but the, uh, here's some actual code. So this is the, uh, the module that I created that does all this, all this stuff. And so what I'm, what I've, uh, the way I did it, and I, I actually did not use rules at all for this part. This is when I was talking earlier, for, for those of you that were in the rules talk, and I, and I was saying that it could eliminate custom code. This is exactly the kind of stuff that I was talking about. Um, not that this is a, a really complicated module, but, you know, it was kind of like, yeah, I bet I could have done a lot of this stuff without writing a bunch of code. So uh, I have in here a uh, node form alter. Um, so I know there, there are probably some beginners in here. Uh, using the, uh, the form alter hook is uh, one of the first ways that you'll probably get into messing with stuff in, in Drupal. And so here I'm, I'm specifically looking at the, uh, at the node form, the, the post node form, I guess. And, um, and then I'm adding a checkbox right here. Um, and then the, uh, the message box. And so these are just, uh, there are, I should say, there is, there is a workflow state that, I, that I'm tracking, which is just, it's not even a, a real field. It's just something that I'm sticking on to the node object when it's saved. Um, I'm, I'm not even sure where, if it, uh, how that gets stored in the database or whatever, but it's, um, but it's something that didn't even need a field. It's just kind of like, hey, what, what's, what's the deal with this node right now? Um, just saved with the object. And so, depending on what that state is, um, I can either say that this is a node that has been sent back down to a person or to something that has been sent up to an editor. And so the, uh, the administrative user gets to see, uh, gets a different set of actions, or, the, or the, the state of what's shown on the form, which is to say, the checkbox either says, you know, send this back to the person and here's their message, or send it up to the editor. That's just done based on what the, uh, what the state is and what that, what that user's permissions are. And then the business of changing the author when the node is saved is done in hook node pre-save. So in Drupal 7, there's a, a whole suite of hooks that will, uh, which is how rules in integrates with, uh, with node stuff. But you can also do it yourself in custom code, um, as I um, possibly mistakenly did here. And uh, you can s then that just lets you uh, inspect the, uh, any node that has just been saved, and you can do stuff to it. Um, and so in this case, I'm just making sure to save the original author um, and use it if I, if I need to in, in some way. And then if I am, uh, I'm an administrative user, we're also integrating with content lock module to make sure that only one person is able to edit the thing at any one time. Um, because, you know, administrators can, they have permission to edit content no matter who owns it. So there could be a situation where a user is actually still in the process of editing something, they haven't submitted it yet, and the, uh, the administrator might want to get in there and just take a look around, and this will say, this, this piece of content is locked. Sorry, administrator, even you can't edit it right now, um, unless you break the lock. But um, So, the, and there's a, a series of hooks for dealing with when the node is first saved, uh, is first added to, uh, to Drupal, and then when it is saved later, just making sure that, that the uh, workflow state is managed correctly the whole time. Um, and then I have my hook menu to set up that little uh, custom uh, settings page, and uh, a, couple other, a couple other little bits in here, but, um, but that's, the, uh, that's the, the main thing. Oh yeah, and if, you're, if you ever are sending mail and you're not using rules, um, you will have to use Drupal's sort of weird um, hook mail system, which has, it's not just, uh, it's, it's not two separate things. You need to write two functions for every, um, not for every piece of mail you want to send, but you need at least two functions to send any mail whatsoever. You need an implementation of hook mail, and then you need a separate function that actually bundles up some of the stuff that is shipped into hook mail. It's sort of weird. But uh, yeah, so I have I have my hook mail here that looks at a key, and then I have my my notifications that go to the admin 
and the notifications that go to users telling them that something needs to be edited. It, Can you go back up to the where you were talking about um, the the node is locked? Are oh yeah. You, are you using the same principle like you use if you're if somebody's in view and if somebody else comes in and looks at it, it'll say locked. It, it is the that? same idea. Yes. Um, okay. uh, the question was about this content locking, and is it the same as how views does it? So um, yeah, it. There is a there is a Drupal module called Content Lock. By the way, uh, I I always harp on this. Um, I'm as you can see, I'm not typing out Drupal.org/project/content-lock. Um, if you don't use keyword, uh, if you've never heard of or don't use keyword bookmarks in your browser of choice, I highly recommend you look into them. It's just a super easy way to take something like this and turn it into that. Um, so, yeah, there's, a, there's some stuff that, uh, that you need to uh, apparently hotfix with this module, but it's a, it's a contributed module that, um, that will handle that locking stuff on your nodes for you. How are you integrating this code with these Drupal modules? I mean, this code with these Drupal modules? When you make custom code, how do you, how do you integrate that with the other Drupal modules? I mean, how does that interact? The uh, okay, so yeah, you you said you've been using Drupal for for not very long now. Um, yeah, so the the thing that the thing that you're looking for is hooks. Um, so Drupal has this uh, has a whole suite, and and most uh, of the contributed modules, the, especially the popular ones, have these as well. So it's basically a, a magically named function that you can create in your your own custom code, uh, and if it's depending on how you name it. Um, it's, it's, so like, for example, this, um, this hook node, uh, let's go with the insert. Actually, while, while we're at it, let me, uh, let me show you how this looks. So hook node, and there's a, there's a whole crap load. Uh, this is my, this is dash, which is an offline documentation browser for, uh, basically anything you could possibly want. Um, I like it. It has a has a nice UI and also lets me uh, browse the Drupal API offline um, in a way that's a lot nicer than running a local instance of Drupal with API module running. So anyway, um, there, as you can see over there in the left sidebar, there's a crap load of uh, of these hooks. And so what you do is you take in your custom module, you replace hook with the name of your custom module, and then when uh, when a node is about to be saved. Drupal asks all custom modules, and all, you know, it just basically asks it's in the entire code base, hey, is there anybody who is trying to act right now because we're about to save something? And basically, I'm, I'm invoking hook uh, node pre-save. Does anybody want to do stuff? And then every module that wants to do something gets, a, gets to take a crack at that node. Um, so that's, that's how that works. That's how you integrate your custom code with, with other modules. Um, that uh, that whole thing is going to change with Drupal eight. Oh, great. So so, um, so I would say, uh, but you know, Drupal seven is going to be around for a while. And uh, just next door, they were talking about backdrop. So if you're uh, if you're uh, a little concerned about um, API changes like this with Drupal eight, you can either, I mean, you can check out the Drupal eight stuff, or you can also check out backdrop for for longer term um, support of this style of coding for uh, for Drupal. Um, okay, so that is, uh, you know, I mean, going going into any one of these features in, in, a, in a lot of detail is probably going to be a little a little tough in in the time available. But um, let's see what what else were we going to look at here? Zerb, zerb, zerb. Okay, so I can't remember. I can never remember the the correct URL. Um, okay, so this is. Uh, this is for for those who don't know. Uh, Foundation is a um, it's a front end framework made by these uh, the, these guy this Zurb group. Um, I can't remember are they are they a company or just a group? Yeah, I don't know. Um, but anyway, it's it's a nice front end responsive framework that uh, along the lines of something like Bootstrap. And the uh, the idea is that it just lets you. Uh, leverage a lot of a lot of work through the use of uh, 
HTML classes and a, a suite of existing styles to make a responsive website or, or at least a prototype for a site a lot faster. It just so happened that, uh, that this guy liked the look of, um, of uh, how a foundation site looked almost out of the box. I mean, we did a lot of customization, of course, but, um, but he, he liked how it looked, so we just kind of went with it. Um, so back here... Um, I'll probably have to get out of full screen for this to work. The clutter and go back here. Okay, so we are uh, we are responsive. La di da, um, and a site that I, or another page that actually has a sidebar on it might be a little more illustrious. Is this, is this re the screen we're looking at right now? Is that representative of the out of box? Uh, the behaviors that that uh, that. Uh, Zerb, that foundation gives you, yeah, I mean, this is, it's pretty representative. I mean, it, of course, your site isn't going to look like this if you, if you start with Zerb, uh, or with foundation, rather, but, um, but it is the idea. So in the source, um, I'm trying to remember what, if I'm actually using the responsive column stuff or if I'm not. I don't remember, but, well, one, one, thing I know, uh, one thing I know for sure that I am using, because it, 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 uh, it comes with a bunch of stuff that supports responsive layouts. It also comes with a bunch of components that, will, uh, that give you things like form styles that it, uh, it resets and you know, kind of rejiggers re all that stuff, makes it easy to create buttons that look consistent and, and have a certain look. But uh, I know for sure that I'm using the, the uh, sticky menu uh, thing here. So, whoops, I, it happens. I pick the one that is just a, a single link. Um, so, you know, you've got, you've got a little, uh, little way to dive down into menus like that. Um, and so the, those, are all, uh, those are all things that are just built in. Um, and there's a little expandable CS animated search field, which I, I think might also not be a Zurb thing. But um, there are, if you want to work with it in... Um, in Drupal, I think this is the name. Yeah. Okay. So there, there is a, uh, there is a theme, uh, which is co-maintained or, or maybe primarily in, maintained by LA Drupal's own Ishmael Sanchez, um, and uh, so there is a stable release for uh, for Zer, uh, for Foundation Four and uh, working toward one for the current Foundation Five. Um, so that's a a quick way to get to get a uh, get going on that and just play around with foundation if you're interested in it. Um, so let's see, we are we are running short of time and rapidly approaching lunch. So is there anything else that you'd like to see real quick um, before we before we roll? Unless anybody has a better idea, I'd like to see the CK editor customization. Okay, so what that is, let's see if I can remember what I actually customized. I know where the code is. Uh, you know what? Let's, let's I'll look at the code first and see if I can. Uh, see what we got here. So this is in just a general glue module. So you wrote a little custom module for it? Yeah, uh, when you when you want to do very much CK editor customization, it is a very good idea to create a small module that does... Um, so we are, we are using, on the, the current version of the site, we are using WYSIWYG editor to um, integrate CK editor. <laughs> And so what I've done is just use the, uh, the hook WYSIWYG editor settings alter, um, special hook, and I'm just checking that the, uh, that the editor that is turned on is CK editor, and if so, adding a custom config JavaScript file. Um, you could do this using, uh, by you know, editing the config.js file that comes with, uh, with CK editor when you download it, but you know that is, that's for chumps. So, um, <clears throat> so what you really want? I keep doing this. There we go. Uh, what you want is to have your your own file. Blow this up a little bit. And so this is what um, this is what uh, what you get. And there there is documentation for um, for this kind of stuff. So what uh, what I've done here is. A few things. Uh, apparently, I'm using these. Uh, well, let's let's actually load up the documentation so you can see what it looks like. So here are all the things that are available for you in the uh, in the config object. And so, in the uh, in the 
uh, when you're adding images in the image dialog, there is some preview text that kind of wraps around images and stuff. So I got rid of that. Didn't we didn't want that? The uh, the native spell checker is disabled by default by CK Editor, and uh, we actually didn't want that. We wanted to use the native spell checker um, because this this is a, an Apple person who who likes his native dictionary. So I turned off disabling the thing, um, le thereby leaving it enabled. Um, and in, to do that, you need to also disable the uh, contextual menu plugin that comes with CK Editor. Otherwise, you don't get your standard uh, right-click menu from your operating system. And we also just happened to disable a couple of, uh, of these other plugins um, for, uh, I guess, because he just wanted them disabled. Uh, some other nifty stuff is that you can uh, remap. The CK Editor does come with some custom uh, hotkeys for, for, different, for its different buttons. And so um, there's, there's documentation for that also, which I, I left a note to myself here to uh, remember in the future. Um, so this, uh, I just remapped the ones for, uh, for the link key. I think it might be L by default, uh, command or control L. Um, and he wanted to use the, on a Mac, in most standard applications, it's, that's mapped to K for added hyperlink. And so he just wanted to keep using that. So we remapped that key and just some of the other ones um, that didn't already have one. Oh yeah, okay, so this was the L. And so I guess because uh, with CK Editor you can add keys to something so that you can have multiple keys that will trigger the same button. Um, and so he just didn't want to use uh, L anymore, so I just disabled it. So it was no, no longer mapped. Okay, so this, uh, this dialog definition event, um, yeah, all this other stuff is, is uh, modifying uh, or extending the config object. CK Editor also has uh, events that it can listen to. So um, if you're familiar with JavaScript, this, this will look a lot like um, something like listening to events in jQuery or, or other ways that you can uh, respond to events in JavaScript. So here there's the uh, dialog definition event. And so this is boilerplate code, I believe, from, from some example that I found on, uh, on the IMC website. And so in the image dialog, the things that I wanted to do were, what, what do we got here? So I wanted to change, yeah, okay. So I wanted to change the name of the title field because there's a, um, I think we're using Im the image capture filter module to, uh, to do, uh, to basically generate kind of WordPress style um, image caption uh, wrappers that go around certain images if they have uh, if they have a caption, and so I thought, all right, well, I'll just add a custom field to uh, you know to the content type or something. But really, that didn't make a lot of sense because there are a lot of images, and he wants to be able to post them right in the body and all that kind of thing. So um, I wanted to extend the uh, the image dialog and add fields there, um, and I. I can't remember now if I if I did figure out a way to do that or if I haven't quite uh, sorted that part out yet. Um, just haven't haven't gotten around to it in the API. So I, I know for sure that whether it's because I can't or just because I thought, well, the title field makes sense. We are using the title field, and I'm just renaming it to image caption. And uh, so the way you do the the kind of weird way you do this uh, in CK Editor is I'm grabbing the contents of the field, changing stuff around, then removing it and adding it back. I don't know why. I, I don't know why it works that way, but it just does. And so, um, likewise, to change the label of the class field, um, because in this case I wanted to add the hint that yet, yeah, right, you're going to need to use the retina class here sometimes. Um, so again, getting the class, changing it around, and adding it back. And then uh, removing some fields is, uh, is pretty easy. So um, got rid of the alignment, the H space, V space, and the border because we just weren't using them, so just try and clean the thing up as much as possible. And then down here, um, what is all this nonsense? Actually, that's the nonsense I was actually hoping to see the most, because the reason I wanted to see this so much is I want to be able, on my WYSIWYG, to disable uh, users from being able to specify widths because that breaks responsive. Right. So it, that, that was one of the reasons why I was... I wanted to see this. Yeah. And that, it looked like it's right here, right? I think, um, let's see. So, 
Well, no, it's a little different, but I, I think that it still answers my Well, because, so yeah, what that. I think what this does, uh, I think what a CK editor does by default is it, it's not so much that it puts in width and, height uh, width and height attributes as it uses a style tag that sets the width and height, and that really is hard to override. Uh -huh. So I think, I think this, this does change it so instead of creating style tags, it, um, it might uh, add the width and height. Um, this, this one I wrote long enough ago, and I don't remember this API well enough to be able to tell you just by reading it what happens here, so I'd have to dig around. We can, we can look at it later. And, uh, but theoretically, what I'm suggesting could be done fairly easily. I mean, the, pretty much disable it from the WYSIWYG, right? I will definitely say that it is theoretically possible. I will definitely not say that it is easy. Okay. Um, because the... the <laughs> The, just because the, the, the CK Editor API, it does have documentation, but it doesn't have a lot of, uh, like there's not a lot of example code for, for, uh, for many, many things. So, um, so doable, yes. I'm sure it's doable. Um, easy, maybe not. But, um, but I do think it's possible. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, we are, we are getting close to lunch, and uh, I uh, don't feel like uh, taking up any more of your... Uh, time not to eat. But um, yeah, I mean, if, if there's anything uh, in here that you've seen in the slide that, or, or whatever, if you happen to look at the site later and you're curious about something, feel free to, to ask me. I'll be here um, for a, a good chunk of the rest of the day. So um, yes. Do we have any time left between you talk about the hosting and kind of what you did when, when you found out that the site was so popular? Well, I'll, I'll tell you the quick story, sure. Um, so the, the whole launch day hosting nightmare went like this. Um, we got everything built up, and, and I, we had been talking, you know, he has analytics, and we had been talking about how, what levels of traffic to expect. Uh, I mean, he assumed that probably a lot of people would visit, but, uh, but he, he wasn't sure how many a lot was. And, uh, and we also had, uh, you know, I figured, ah, you know, it's, there's, there's no, like, major release of Aperture coming up, uh, so, you know, we should, be, we should be fine. It seems like it's standing up well, at the, like the pages are loading fast. Um, don't do that. Just that's 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 dumb. If you know the site is at least somewhat popular, and this is a guy who has we there are at last count something like seven or eight thousand registered users. Um, I mean, th this is the major problem: is that the site has a lot of registered user traffic. If it's a ton of anonymous users, you know, as long as you're caching, who cares? Um, but there are, uh, and that was the other thing that we didn't know: is like how how many of the users log in and do stuff, or do they browse it a lot anonymously and only log in occasionally? Those analytics we did not have. So, um, so it's just kind of like, well, we'll just see how it goes. <laughs> and how it went was not well. Um, the, uh, the site uh, was up for about an hour before it died um, and just, uh, just could not spin up again um, because there was, just, uh, there, were, there was too much traffic. So, um, so that, that ended up being, uh, the site is it's hosted on, on Linode. Um, which that, that by itself is fine, but you still have to, you know, do do everything else uh, correctly. So uh, we didn't have APC running. We didn't have uh, we didn't have memcache running yet. Um, so basically, it was like, oh my god, we have to cache like crazy. And so I just spent a, a had a very panicked uh, several hours of like just getting all these uh, all these things compiled into the uh, in and like configured to get them running on. We're we're using Nginx, which also helps performance wise over Apache. But um, but just had to get everything together, and once once I got that uh, running, like memcached APC, all of a sudden everything was great. Um, so really, just getting um, getting a, a little bit of I mean, it's you know I was able to do it in a panic in a couple hours. So uh, so as long as you get that stuff rolling, you can deal with authenticated users, um, even a lot of them, pretty well on still relatively modest hosting. That we we do have. Uh, the site is, is ha there's like one big web head, um, and then one separate database server, which is, which is just on the, on the lowest end. Um, I think it's like a gig, uh, a gig memory, uh, Linode, the, the cheapest one that I, I think it's the cheapest one they're selling now. So, um, and that has never needed to be touched, uh, as, as far as like being, being expanded or, or anything like that. Mm -hmm. The web head, um, is, is, a uh, it's it's one of their eight gig ones now, um, but I don't think it's even. Uh, I, I think even at the highest traffic levels, it had around the days that um, that Aperture was was being threatened, and then finally um, Apple publicly announced that they're they're going to deprecate it. 
Um, even then, it, it was it maybe got up to like four gigs of, of memory for um, for those uh, for those levels of traffic. So, and and I think also off offloading um, a lot of the mail sending activity to Mandrill helped. Um, so there was no mail queue running on the site, and um, so it, it really is just responsible just for um, for serving the site and, and doing all the Drupal stuff. So, but yeah, I would definitely advise you if you have many thousands of users that are actually re uh, active on any kind of regular basis to uh, think very seriously about making sure you know how to cache. <laughs> so, yeah. Anything else? Well, thanks. Yeah.